So back on July 26th of 2021, we released a video called How Deep Can Humans Dive? And on that video, we share the fact that the deepest ever recorded saturation dive was down to 1,752 feet, which is 534 meters. That's ridiculous depth. And, you know, one of the friends of, of the show, Dr. Doug Ebersole, he reached out to us and said, I mean, you guys know that Joe has been deeper than that, right? We were like, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, you should reach out to Joe and ask if he wants to talk about it for Dive Talk. The Joe that he's talking about is Joe Dituri. He was a commander in the U.S. Navy. He was a, um, a saturation diver for the Navy. He's done a lot of amazing things, um, you know, in the Navy. And he has a Ph.D. in biomedicine. I mean, he's a, an expert in decompression. Um, so we reach out to him and ask him. He's also the training director for INTD uh, and a, an amazing cave diving trainer. Um, and we reached out to him and said, Doug, uh, um, sorry, Joe, is it true that you've been deeper than 1,700 feet, the deepest ever recorded saturation dive? And he said, yes, you guys should come to Tampa so we can talk about it. So, of course, we hop on a plane, me and Woody, we fly down to Tampa where he owns the Undersea Oxygen Clinic. We walk in, we get there. Uh, we get there about five minutes early. He says, just come in, come in, stand on the back, just be quiet. Let me finish this class. And as he's finishing the class, I start recording some video of him like teaching the class. He's talking about the compression medicine and stuff. I also noticed that behind me, there's like some Navy awards and diplomas and stuff. So I turn around and start recording uh, the kind of the pilot license that he has for the suit, the one atmosphere suit that he used to dive deeper than the deepest ever recorded saturation dive. And I'm also, you know, recording here a, a picture of the actual suit. And you can see on the reflection that even though we were supposed to stay back in the back of the room, Woody just decides to wander off and go into some other room in this place that we've never been. And because I noticed that he wandered off, I decided to follow him, and here's what happened. Or, or uh, wait till symptoms decide. You will ascend at one foot per minute mm -hmm. till probably wait, 50 feet. Pressure, so you're at 60 feet. It depends on your prescription. Um, but what? anywhere up to three atmospheres. What in um, the most common is about two. Uh, we, that's super rare. We and, just got here. Um, even at three, that would be very rare. We literally just got here. Yeah, watch whatever you want up there. Um, it's a sliding scale, so it's it kind of your your risk increases up until about two, and it stays the same. And then all of it till about three, you know, it goes up slightly. And after three is when it kind of goes up exponentially. Um, I've never seen it. I don't think it's ever happened here. Um, since I've been working here, I haven't seen it. Yeah, so if someone's actively convulsing, we have to wait because I'm not going to increase, decrease the pressure while you're clenched. Wait, right, because your airway, your airway could be closed. Not your airway's closed. So the only thing we can do at that point is I would have our medical air, which is which is regular 21% air, and I'd come over here, and I'd um, there's this little valve. It's right up against the chamber. I don't know if you can see it. Um, this little little green valve, and it will push 15 liters per minute of air in there, and that's all I can do while you're actively convulsing. Automatically lower the PO2, and then I just stop convulsing. Yes, you um, generally people essentially correct me if I'm wrong, but people get tired like their bodies literally get tired and they'll stop convulsing and at that point I start bringing you up and this is just the one only other thing we can do to try to make that happen sooner or potentially bring it low enough so you stop convulsing because the O2 gets low but either way you should stop. So and then why, why are we convulsing? Like what, that's what they don't really understand, right? Like, what's causing the convulsion? I mean, I'm on oxygen at a high pressure. It's just, that's the big mystery I've asked them. And everybody's like, we don't know exactly. Yeah, it's it's not um, fully it's not understood. What? Some, don't know. It's something to do with um, uh, some, uh, yeah, right. some oxygen so, radicals and so forth. So There's a lot of thoughts as to what it may be coming from. It's not known for sure. Just normally how to do it. All that we know. Why? 
How do you think you press a 10? Yeah, there's a few you good things. Because you remember they're at 30 feet, and then they ascend to the Alien. surface at one point per minute. <laughs> so this takes 30 minutes, well, so. and the last stop that they're on Who? is no two stop, and this is a so same minute no two stop, stop right? right out there. So you're looking at this, and it says the last Joe's been down 30 minutes, down feet. so from about, I'm just going to take it. For sure. They are in the rear view. Yeah. I know they're sense. No, it's not. Don't, don't bring aliens up. Don't. They're down there. No, don't. They're gonna kick us out. This is this is a serious place. These are scientists, Woody. This guy has a PhD. Don't. So really, what you're doing is He's going to kick us out of here. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> I am here with Gus. I am right. here with Dr. Doug Eversall. Oh. I am here with Dr. Joseph Deturi. And here's where we're at, everybody. I want to set this up a little bit. We are at the Undersea Oxygen Clinic. We're in Tampa, Florida. Tampa. Woohoo. West Coast, baby. Tampa and Bay. we have been wanting to interview him for a while. There is some incredible stuff that this man has done. I want you to give a little bit of a background. It's very long. If you look up his resume, you can do a little bit. You have I to mean, do it's unbelievable. I mean, seriously, how many years in the military doing? Yep. Interesting. 28 years in the Navy. I had. I was blessed being a Navy diver. I got to do special operations. I got to do deep submergence. I was blessed to be able to work with uh, Special Operations Command and design and have built dry combat submersible. And then I decided to retire, went back to school, got a PhD in biomedical engineering. And now I do clinical research in hyperbaric medicine. I teach med school, a 40 AMA1 CME course in hyperbaric medicine. And I, did, I have a lot of fun and I cave dive occasionally. <laughs> so you made, it, you made your life around diving. After diving in the military, yep. Your whole world was diving related after that. Kind of, sort of. Did um, you deviate ever outside of diving? He jumps out of planes. Uh, I jump out of planes. I'm, That's I'm, the thing. I'm, uh, yeah, it's like if you if you if you look at you, like your YouTube channel, like every video, there's a different badass activity. <laughs> it's like like wrestling alligator. Here's, here's me jumping out of, out of a biplane. Go look at that. Here's me doing this. Look at that. It's just look, man. The unexplored life is not worth living. So just just live it, man. It's getting after it. Okay. So awesome. let's start with this. Let's set it up like this. What is this place? What are you doing here in general? So this is the Undersea Oxygen Clinic, and what we do is we administer hyperbaric oxygen, hyperbaric, more pressure oxygen, to you, to uh, individuals that come here by prescription, and they get treated for all kinds of ailments. Osteomyelitis, gaseous gangrene, carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, uh, a gamut of approved and even off-label indications, because we want to treat those that are in need, you know? And in the off-label indications, right. I was asking this a minute ago, are you seeing yourself improvement of various different things? And if so, like give an example of something you've absolutely seen improvement on. Right, right, right. So once again, non-peer reviewed, non-double blind, non-placebo controlled studies that I'm doing right now that are, we're working towards get, listen, every indication was off label except for DCS. And then we made a burden of proof and then all of a sudden we got AG and we made a burden of proof and we got burns and we made a burden of proof and we got, you know, whatever. So for instance, one of them that's looking really good right now in Joe's opinion is Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Now, let me back up a little bit. Since we have the cardiologist here, I wanna ask. So doctor, what was the initial use for Viagra? Uh, actually Viagra was an anti-anginal drug for people with heart disease. Um, so it's, low, a it's a vaso, low blood pressure, right? It was a vasodilator, so it would dilate coronary arteries to get angina to go away. Right. It's just when they did the studies, they found it had a very interesting side effect profile. So I that's the, that was more marketable than the original indication. So that's the on-label indication. Right. So give me an example of an off-label use of that particular drug. <laughs> what? Well, <laughs> erectile dysfunction, <laughs> right? <laughs> so now it's an off-label use. So that's illustrative of on-label oxygen use and off-label oxygen use. Doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that it's not FDA approved yet. Yet. Remember, every single indication was not approved except for decompression sickness. So 
but then they became approved over time once they meet a burden of proof. We have seen Crohn's and ulcerative colitis right now that is really well responsive to that's a That's an inflammatory, yes. if you don't know, that's an inflammatory disease of the colon. They're kind of cousins. Wow. Yeah, I don't um, know anything. Yeah, it's, no, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ulcer of the, of the colon. Uh, ulcerative colitis puts you at risk for colon cancer, often requires a full colectomy. Um, Crohn's disease is a more chronic disease and causes fistulas. So it's just a very debil, both are very debilitating yeah. diseases. Pain, you know, I hate to be tied to the but, bathroom. Yeah, 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 yeah lots, <laughs> lots of diarrhea, a lot of bloody, bloody stools. You know, just a terrible, very um, debilitating, not necessarily fatal illness, but a no. very debilitating illness. So anything that can improve that would be huge for people's, you know, yeah. so uh, quality as, of life. As exciting as this conversation is, okay. <laughs> can we? It's a crappy conversation. <laughs> can we? Move on to something that's else. good. Are that's we allowed to say that? That's a crappy <laughs> conversation. Go ahead. No, but I want to go, go back go because I want to talk about when you went into the Navy, like going back, like being a diver, is that why you went into the Navy or did you end up just being a diver? Because I know a lot of people go into the Navy or into the Army or whatever it is and they end up doing a job that is not exactly what they wanted to do. All right, so I'm going to wrap myself out here. I did not pay attention in high school, so pay attention in high school. Uh, so I did not pay attention in high school. I was bored, I was whatever, I was scatterbrained, whatever, whatever. I did not do very well. On my SAT, I got a 910. I know. So my 910 <laughs> on the PhD SAT, and everything. right? So the 910 on the SAT afforded me exactly zero college possibility, but I wanted to get out of New York because I grew up in Long Island in New York, and I knew that I was not going to be hanging out on the corner of 4th Street and 4th Avenue for very long, just like my brother <laughs> and his cousin and friends and all that, and I just wasn't going to do it. So I needed to get the heck out of Dodge. Navy was really my only choice. I could have gone in the Marine Corps, but my mother wouldn't have signed the papers. Didn't want to go in the Air Force because I, I don't know, it just don't look good in blue, I don't know. And then, uh, <laughs> so, so that was basically it. In the Army, I don't look good in green, so poof, I'm in the Navy. But when you're in the Navy then, yep. what, how did you go down this track? So, interestingly enough, I joined the Navy and I went as a nuke because I scored really well on the ASVAB, the uh, standard aptitude test for the military. Scored really well on that and they said, you can go be a nuke. So I went to nuclear power school and it was in Orlando, Florida, right here. And he was I, in the school with Anthony uh, Biscolo. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's why <laughs> yeah. I remember you guys. So were we were chit chatting about, about that. But it's like, the, you know, it's the, okay, this person can actually do some logical thinking. Okay, great. So I was on a motorcycle and I was coming up from I 4 to the East West Expressway and I wrecked my motorcycle and I ended up in the hospital. Found out I chipped my hip during that and then I had eczema. So when I mm. showed up, I had this eczema and the guy goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Doctor goes, you're not allowed to be a nuke. And I'm like, whoa, my contract done says thou shalt be a nuke. And I was in nuke power school and I was good and blah, 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 doing okay. And they were like, no, you can't be a nuke. You're medically disqualified. And I was like, uh, that's not gonna work because I have a contract. And then the Navy offered me my choice of any school in the Navy. And I said, wait, is this diver thing real? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I kind of like diving because my dad had introduced me to diving. My first scuba diving lesson was my dad. I think it was 11 years old and I had a double hose regulator and he basically said, oh, hey, by the way, just don't hold your breath. That was my <laughs> entire awesome. diving education well, from Angelo. Right? So Breathe in and out, repeat as necessary. And then what I did was I went onto his boat in the canal in New York. You can imagine, right? So it's filthy and there's a shopping cart here and there's a, and I'm, and I'm doing this with, with a zinc tab. There's probably a body over there, I didn't look. <laughs> so I'm, t I'm trying to take a zinc tab off uh, with, a, uh, with an Allen key, trying to take that zinc tab off and put another one on. And uh, a fish comes swimming up and goes, boop, hits me right in the face. And it goes, boop, hits me right in the face again. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool, I wanna do this. And then, you know. That's it, here After we that, I'm like, right, you can dive in the Navy, that's a thing. <laughs> Okay, so now, awesome. so, so jumping way ahead, I, I oh, don't yeah. want to get too technical. Now I want to get into right now. Yeah. What is the single most amazing area that either you're working on or that is being worked on as it relates to improving the technology or the gas we breathe or anything as it relates to diving? Something really cool 
Cutting edge stuff. Cutting edge. Yeah. You messaged me a little bit about it, but I want you to talk about it. Yeah. So w we do have some cutting edge stuff. I mean, the, the more we improve the gear, the longer we can stay. I remember being a cave diver in the early 90s, trying to get back to the Hinkle required so many stage bottles. Now it's like you got to rebreathe, you jump in, you get on your scooter, zzz, you're there in like seven minutes, eight minutes, whatever it is, you know. Your scooter's on 12, you're, you're back at the Hinkle, and then you can go explore. So we're getting deeper, longer as the rebreathers improve, as the quality of the computers improve. But that's not the, that's not the, that's the art of the possible. So what is the next next? The next next, I'm telling you, it's biometric monitoring, Joe's opinion. I believe that we are going to tie biometric monitoring to people and we are going to find out their decompression, their individual decompression predicated upon how their heart's beating, what their Doppler is from their hooked up, what their heart rate variability is, because heart rate variability is an indicator of stress. Decompressive stress is a stress. If you're stressing the autonomic nervous system, you can get a key before you actually get a, a sign or symptom of decompression sickness. That's just Joe's opinion. I'm just throwing that out there. So by having that individual analysis going yep. on, you can optimize something exactly for them. Oh, that's God, what you're yeah. saying. So you optimize the decompression for you on that day. <laughs> that's on that day. Joe's opinion yeah. on that day. Uh, that's and that's cool. the way all the medicines go into personalized medicine. Oh, it's got to. It's that way in all the medicines. Yeah. Okay, but, and I'm reading some notes here because I don't And by wanna, the way. Yeah, keep going. Uh, Joe's saying this not as a guy who's out of the Navy and doing this kind of, Joe still works contract-wise with the military. Yep. So he's still very much involved in all the cutting edge Navy stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm But, but you, you, you messaged me something else, some other uh, that does something related to helping circulation. It's, uh, let me read exactly, what was it called again that he was saying? Let me read your answers and you were like, this is the coolest thing that we're working on right now. And I should have had this up. So it's called nitric oxide synthetic. That's what I'm yeah. trying to, that, that, <laughs> what he just said. So tell me about that. So, so it's a smooth muscle mediator. And interestingly wow. enough, there are three kinds of them. One's inducible, one's excitable, and one's neuronal, right? Inducible, yeah. excitable, and neuronal. And one comes from um, high intensity cardiovascular work. So if you do like 30 minutes of hit, uh, and I'm talking high, like, 180 or above cardiovascular work, right? Yeah, that's High intensity like. cardiovascular. What it does is it puts a sheath on the inside of the endothelium lining. So not to get really complex, it's just, it, it's prophylactic to having the, or it protects you from having the bubbles form on the inside of the endothelium lining, which if you read Steve Thom's stuff is kind of predictive of decompression sickness. Now remember, we don't know what causes really decompression sickness. We think it has something to do with bubbles. Look at some of that, look at some of the wow. videos online. But the, the whole, if you protect the inside of the endothelium lining with something that prevents you from having those bubbles form hmm. that's hydrophobic that won't let those bubbles sit on the inside of the endothelium lining you could possibly cure decompression sickness i think that's a thing but so there's excitable inducible wow. and neuronal right the one of them you get from high cardiovascular work the other one you get from a statin drug called lipitor and joe did not tell you to go out and dive lipitor and i am not a medical doctor i have a phd in biomedical engineering so don't listen to me listen to dr eversol because he's he's a medical doctor i'm just a real doctor and we're just the house of dive talks so <laughs> definitely don't listen to us yeah, no. No, but okay. that's true. The statins but, though, do do in, increase uh, nitric oxide, decrease inflammation, and so forth. Right. Same kind of concept. Right. But but are pe so how are they testing this? Like what's going on with it? Oh my goodness. So so here's the real story. There's not enough money in diving to do these kind of tests. When I was in the Navy, we had done some of these type tests and I was like, ooh, I wonder if this, and then, you know, before you knew it, this guy couldn't be bent, but he was on 80 milligrams of Lipitor and you're like, what's going on here? This is weird. And then you had to stop because you have these trip gates uh, when you're doing uh, when you're doing your research, you have to have these off ramps for, we, we went too high, right? So basically we couldn't bend this guy and we were like, hey, what's going on? So we immediately they theorized nitric oxide synthate uh, from the uh, Lipitor was putting a prophylactic sheath on the inside end of the endothelium lining, preventing, but it makes sense because the Navy dive tables are predicated upon an 18 to 24 year old male in peak physical condition, right? We used to PT crazy, no, right? No. Not, once like, I wasn't in the Navy. <laughs> so this is another reason to be in peak physical condition because if you're doing high intensity cardiovascular work, 
you're actually getting that prophylactic lining yourself. You're putting it on there. So you're not taking it from the pator. So there's yet another reason. So another reason why Navy divers weren't getting bent, but you shouldn't dive the Navy dive tables if you're not in peak physical condition or 18 to 24 years old. No, I'm not 18, I'm not 18 anymore. No. no. So, so then really then there's nothing much more going on with it right now. It's yeah, so sort of you need what you need is money. Yeah. Anybody got any money? Okay. So yeah, this is well, this is where Joe thinks the end all be all is. But that's just an opinion, man. This is like everybody's got one. Speaking of money, though, like you know, Joe, you the 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 cool thing that I learned about you a long time ago was <laughs> where you end up, like where you evolved as a diver within the Navy. Because I assume you didn't start diving on the one atmosphere suit, no, right from day one. Nope. So you. Tell us a little bit of your story as a diver. Like, where do you start in the Navy, and how do you end up being selected to dive this thing? Well, no. what is it, first of all? What yeah. is the one atmosphere suit? So the suit? one atmosphere suit is a pressurized suit. Uh, basically, it is a big, thick aluminum suit, and uh, you get in it, and you can go to up to 2,000 feet. It's a one-man submarine. It is a one-man submarine. That's basically exactly it. It is pressurized to one atmosphere all on the inside and on the outside you can withstand pressure because of the pressure barrier that is afforded to you by the aluminum. So what is involved in the training? I mean, do oh, I just get right. in this thing okay. and start breathing? And you, you want to do it next week, right? Yeah. Well, I want to take the class, but we get into that. I want you to certify me on that. I don't think we have enough budget so, to buy. But no, seriously, well, it seems like I just get in this thing and I start breathing and somebody controls me from the boat or something. Breathe in and out, repeat as necessary, right? So it, it is when I designed the curriculum for uh, the training and, uh, and I worked that through, uh, it was turned over to me as it was introduced to the Navy and then I took it on the first international exercise. I became a pilot. There are 35 pilots in the world. My number is 21. You're it takes 20 no. hours of flight time before you can be considered a pilot. Minimum 20 hours of flight time before you can I have be time pilot. next week. Yeah. And what I we do is, we get, oh, you got 20 hours? Easy. <laughs> so uh, it, the suit is 1,500 pounds. This suit, now there are a lot of one atmosphere suits, but this one goes 2,000 feet. There are many like it, but this one's mine. Did you go to 2,000 feet? <laughs> 2,000 feet. 1,947 feet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Like I said, I stepped in the right lighting, right? And and I am blessed. Your eyeballs have looked out this suit and seen oh, please don't things please. at 1,947 <laughs> feet. Yeah. I'm telling you, you have, yeah. right? Yep. yep. Yeah, but the, Joe, the, don't. don't this is, I know you're not going to admit this, but what? we know yeah. you know that you saw aliens down there. <laughs> there's no. There are NTIs, yes. baby. NTIs if you watch the abyss. What <laughs> so he did. Yeah. The abyss. The abyss. the abyss. Those guys are down there. I, listen, I did I I wanted to get it out there. He he's no. No. I think so. Okay. Yeah, stop. Well, that's off topic, but that's I think probably so. what he did see down there he can't tell you. But what do you do? Why why have it? As much as you can say, I don't want to put you in jeopardy. Why do no. we have this? What is the Navy doing with this thing? So this was called intervention for submarine rescue. And what you do is you fly the suit down. A submarine crashed on the bottom of the ocean. You'd fly the suit down. You'd go clear the suit. Maybe you drop off a pod inside a, uh, a life support pack inside the submarine, you open the door of the submarine, you drop it in the first one, you close the door, and then they can evacuate the water out of it and get that life support pod. And then you set it all up and clear the hatch. That's called the intervention aspect. And then the rescue asset, which is either the um, McCann rescue chamber or the pressurized rescue module, which I put into uh, service in the Navy as well. And they could sit down on it and evacuate the people out of it and do a dry transfer. Pressure. How much dexterity do you have with the suit? You're talking about opening doors and stuff. Not as, much, not as much as you would think. So you got to get really well qualified in the pool. You do lots of stuff. Remind me about the knot rope. But yeah. everybody, thinks, everybody thinks that what separates us from everybody else is the opposable thumb. Well, if that was the case, lobsters would run around and rule the earth. You don't see lobsters <laughs> running around, do you? Right. What really separates us from other creatures is our ability to what we call prehense. That's touch this finger, touch this finger, touch this finger, touch this finger, opposing. So if you can move your thumb like this, this is what helps you grab things. If you ever tried to pick up rice with two chopsticks like this, you really, it's hard, right? So, you know, it's kind of a tough thing to do. And that's exactly what you have on these 
on these one atmosphere soups is what's called a manipulator. So all you have is the ability to do this. So you gotta grab something, pick it up, you can twist it, but you can only twist as far as your wrist will twist, and that's it. And remember, you're picking it up with a chopstick, so that's all you can do. Yikes. Really, really hard, dexterity, flying, you know, and, and you know, you're sitting basically on a bicycle seat for up to eight hours, and you're trying to fly this suit to get over to whatever you're doing and move wires and cut things and, you know, use tools and all kinds of other stuff. And when, so, you, when you say flying it, you, you mean there's like pedals or sticks to move things around? There's not like a computer. It's more of a joystick thing? Yeah. So what you got is you, you are sitting on a bicycle seat and you have your feet free. They're not touching the bottom. And it's toe down to go down, heel down to go up, forward, backward, left, right, right? So, uh, oh yeah. So That's all good if you happen to be in one position all the time, but you're in a 300. Until you go this way and you're laying down and you're working your project and then it's toe Office down forward. to go backwards. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then it's heel down to go forward. And it's like, oh, it's a, oh and then man. you're trying to, you're trying to chase around. This is the knot rope training. Yeah, right. They take a rope, it's tied. It has a knot on one end, a knot on the other end, and it has a washer, a bolt, a, wa a washer, a nut, a washer, a nut, a washer, a nut, a washer, a nut. They take it, they empty it in the pool, they unknot the rope, and they throw the rope in the pool. Your job, fly over, get the rope, tie a knot in one end. Fly over, pick up a washer, put the washer on the rope. Fly over, pick up a nut, put the nut on the rope. Fly over, pick up a washer. Oh my God. Did you do it? Wow. Yeah, I did. Of course, the other license. And then you got to tie it. You have to be able to do it. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a qualification to, yeah. to be a pilot. Yeah. And then you have to know all the sim all, all everything that's going on in that. So if you look at that thing, it is a giant rebreather. Yeah, it yeah, has it's to a be. giant rebreather, right? So yes. there's a huge thing of carbon dioxide absorbent and you know, you have metabolic makeup, which is for oxygen and you know, so it's really neat. So what, and the what, washers always end up in the corner of the pool where you can't get oh it, man. Like, the claw to go. Killing me. <laughs> Brutal. So <laughs> what I was thinking about with that, we were talking about that it's a basically a rebreather and has O2 and it has a scrubber. And you know, no most of rebreather right. training has to do with when stuff doesn't go right. <laughs> That's what rebreather training is. Right. It's all great when it's yeah, working. Yeah. You just yep. sit there yep. and you breathe and you got a perfect PO2. Yep. What is the training that you do when things go bad in here? O2. You stab yourself in the heart. You're 2,000 feet <laughs> underwater. You have a, it's yeah. no longer at one atmosphere pressure or the O2 yeah. isn't firing right or the scrubber is not firing right. Exactly. Can, it, can it flood? It, it can flood. If you flood at 2,000 feet, you're at 810 pounds per square inch pressure Five, coming so. in. So you do, we've, we've said that we'd be like, not only would it cut you in half, it would cauterize the bleeding wound. And, <laughs> <laughs> you'd be fine, right? so there's no drill. What happened was. <laughs> no, okay. So seriously, you have to, but you do have yeah. to train. Lots of emergency procedure emergencies. training. So I was the guy that was in charge of that setup. And I told the training master chief, I said, listen, we, when I took over, I said, we have dove our last unfaulted dive. Every dive we will train. Everyone, the yellow hat came out and somebody was doing a drill. So we train like we fight, we fight like we train. Carbon dioxide scrubber material failed, this failed, this fan failed, oxygen pressure low, blah, blah. So yeah, you trained every dive. So it wasn't only the 20 hours that you got. Every dive you did in the suit, there was a drill. Yikes. Have they ever used this suit Dude, to not. extract the, I'm gonna ask a, okay. a very, a, I, he doesn't have the answer. <laughs> Like, let's say that we have bad guys. You can't see me, right? The only way that bad guys can get off of their Middle Eastern land, like Syria or something that's only like accessible to them by water would be to bring them on a submarine what? and then get them into something and bring them through this thing back up to the surface type of thing. Some kind of a terrorist <laughs> oh extraction God. thing. I'm just thinking that would be a great use. Yes, that sounds like a terrific use. It sounds like, I can, sounds like a James Bond. Well, I think that's going on. <laughs> I can I can neither confirm nor deny the fact. No, it's going to see. I knew it. I knew it. That's awesome. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. How much do these things cost to make them, and then who makes them? Uh, so they are made by a company called um, Hard Suits. They're out of Canada. So like we get, so we get we get the one atmosphere suit shipped to us, and it has this big pot leaf on my freaking suit, and I'm like, hey, who put the
the pot leaf on my suit. It's a Canadian flag. I'm like, oh, did I offend you? I'm sorry. I'm like, well, we're taking the pot leaf off the suit. Okay? <laughs> so it's made in Canada, and uh, they were they were the bidder that won, and they did a great job on it. And now they've commercialized. They have a commercialized version of this suit. You know, it, it, uh, it was initially theorized by a guy named Phil Newton. It was, in fact, the Newt suit. So the Newt suit converted to the hard suit. The hard suit made by Hard Suits Incorporated or, you know. So do you know how about how much they cost? Uh, a lot of freaking money. I don't know. Would I didn't it be buy in the hundreds of thousands, or it would be a million dollar type of thing. Uh, it's got to be over a million. It's a submarine, so we, yeah, we thought it had to be. And each piece of it. Now you you talked about the dexterity, right? right. So there's a piece here, there's a piece here, 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 yeah. and then a piece on the wrist. So yeah, all of that. those are separately poured blocks of aluminum that are milled out because we didn't want to pour the mold and then have there be some porous in there because it could crack, right? Under 2000, well, you know, 810 PSI at 2000 feet of seawater would be bad. So what we did was we filled block and then we poured it all out. And then we use this equivalence principle in a liquid filled joint to use as much pressure pushing in as pressing back. It's, it's a great idea. And what you wind up doing is being able to turn pretty well. So you can go like this, you can go like this, you can go like this, but you're still limited by the person's shoulder dexterity and they're, you know, yeah. it can't swim in it. I mean, the suit's 1500 pounds. So what, what do they do? So did they like take the people that they selected and like make suits to fit them or they just pick people to fit the suit? Yeah, so you can put extra put rings in it to make you taller. Oh, okay. You can go down to, I think the minimum was five, six, the maximum was six, four. There we go, so you um, get some of those big oh, guys, six, eight, I wanna oh, be in this with, I forget it. I had, I had a guy who was my MD, who was a former Navy SEAL, and his quads were too big to fit inside the ring of the suit. So he put his legs down and, and the suit literally stopped him. But, <laughs> but, was, but he was Quadzilla. I mean, this guy's huge. Yeah, Quadzilla. <laughs> Are you still doing anything with the military, with special ops, any kind of training with them? I, uh, from time to time, I am hired to do things for the government, just fun stuff for me. And uh, it's just using my expertise, stuff that I learned in the military and stuff that I learned in the civilian world and combining that and then bringing it to the military and helping them. So from time to time I am, my government calls me, trust me, I would cut my hair and go back in the military. You can bank on that. I would. You the, would, you would. In a minute. You loved it. The one thing that I miss, the guys. Yeah. Like I had guys and it was great and there's camaraderie and it's fun and we're doing cool things together and then you retire from the military and it's like, I got you guys and I could go cave diving with Doug. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we could have cave diving, that's fun. But, but you know, like your brother from another mother was that person in the military that did the same training as you, spilled blood in the same mud, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. So, Outside of all of this, you're also, I don't know the official title, you're the Director of Education, maybe that's the Train, title. Training director. Training director of IANTD. Yep, the International Association of Nitrox and Technical Divers. At one point, I owned stock in that company, and they made me the training director. They asked me to be the Tom Mount, asked me to be the training director. My mentor asked me to be the training director. So when your mentor asks you something, you say yes. So we did that for a lot, a lot of years, and then I sold off the shares, and I then I went back to school, I got my PhD, and during that time I was like, Tom, I cannot help you during this time. And then it was time, I was finished with my PhD, and the guy who was the training director was looking to move on, and he said, hey, do you want to be it again? I was like, one, two, three, and I tried to say, not it. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, you're in. I'm like, oh, all right, I'll do it. But what I do is I enforce the standards, I train the standards, we write the standards, there's a committee of people, him on it, that we get together and we go, hey, what do we think we should do for this? And then we put that out, we do common consensus type guidance. And then I work with all the other training agencies. For those of you out there that think that the training agencies don't talk, oh man, myself and Sean Harrison from TDI, we talk all the time. Oh, Certainly we used to do it more than we have done lately because it's pretty well run in lockstep. But you know, the guys from Nowy, the guys from Patty, we talk all the time. Yes. So don't think that you can just jump back and forth between agencies. <laughs> we're, no, all, no. we're all actually friends. <laughs> yeah, and they really are, wouldn't you say that the training agencies, like we're, we do a really good job, I think, of self-governing. I mean, these are yeah. really strict, these standards. I mean, yeah. they think of, a lot of details as it goes into the training and then they enforce those standards. Yep. 
So we enforce the, the standards. Well, we want talking. the instructor to be at this level, right? We want the instructor to be able to do this. We want the instructor to teach that. And you know, it's like from time to time I get the, oh, this guy was actually doing an open water trimix class inside of Eagle's Nest. And I'm like, eh, he's not allowed to do that. Here's the reason, here's the rule that he violated. Let's not do this, let's not do that. Yeah. Whatever, you know, it's yeah. like that kind of stuff, you know? So you do an open water dive, you gotta be in open water. You can't be in an overhead environment. It's just the rules, sorry. I don't make the rules, I just enforce them. <laughs> okay, so my final question, and I don't know if anybody else has it. What's your, I ask this to a lot of people, what's your end game? Like where are you, how much longer are you planning on doing all these things that you're doing? Uh, and when you do retire, whatever that, what do you want to do? So um, when, I re when I got out of the military, retired after 28 years, I said, I want to figure out what I want to do. I had this crisis of life. I, you know, I had been in the military. Still, I had been in the military longer than I have been not in the military, right? So I have to live till I'm 56 in order to be into the military as long as I was out of the military, right? Yeah. So I had a complete crisis and I didn't know what I wanted. So I went back to the drawing board and I started with Deming, the end in mind. Keep the end in mind, what do you want to be when you grow up? And for humans, what is that? It's a tombstone. So if you look at the tombstone, what do they want to say on your eulogy, right? What do you want to be said about you? Yes. I want to help make aquanauts, astronauts, and subsea submersibles safer. That's what I want to do. So I made my vision board. I start driving towards that. I needed the PhD so I could do that. I could do this research to make stuff safer, to help people to kick that can down the road. And like I said, astronauts, aquanauts, same, same thing. I mean, my master's is in astronautical engineering. You know, my PhD is in biomedical engineering. It's all life support. Everybody's like, no, it's not. I'm like, Trust me, it's the same, similar. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I'm, I'm just thinking, that I just want to be able to get a little bit better trim on my feet. <laughs> That's my answer. That's, right. going That's all. I, I mean, it's different. <laughs> you guys all heard what he wants to help astronauts, and I'm thinking maybe. Yeah. It's all right? decompression strategy, right? It's a little bit. No, but we really appreciate this. Um, we had to come here. And oh see my you. goodness! Look, and I'll tell you this: we are we are one of the West Coast's only uh, 24/7, 365 dive retreatment chambers. You do not want to be bent for the first time when you come here. Come, we're open. We're we're pretty approachable, so come on in. Uh, you know, we're at 701 Northwest Shore Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33609. Give us a call. Look us up at UOC Tampa Undersea Oxygen. Uh, I'm sorry. HBO Tampa. I don't even know my own address. HBOTampa.com. Look us up and we'll take you in here. We'll give you a tour. We'll show you what it's like. And this way, the first time you come to the Hyperic Treatment Center is not when you're doubled over in pain. Yes, it's pretty amazing too. I got a uh, chance anybody's to Anybody's medical wants training. Oh yeah, and we teach oh. 40 AMA1 CMEs to physicians in hyperbaric medicine. I also teach that class at the University of South Florida too. So, you know, if you want to come and have fun, you'll be learning the exact same medical stuff that you know, guys like Dr. Yeah, Dub Eversall learned, which he didn't learn anything from me. I actually, he was in the class, but I learned a lot from him. When he was I in love the when class. Doug says, that. "Oh yeah, we took that class for fun one day." We were like, "What, <laughs> yeah. what do we do this week?" And now oh, let's just take a class for right. fun. Right, exactly. Quite cool. like our ice diving class. Yeah. There you go. Um, so much fun. Okay, so that that's really cool. I I did tour this week. We got to tour it a little bit while ago. I think you got some footage of you it. Use some that B roll Marvel. footage. And you got yeah. some, you got some footage too. We so. got some footage. So. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Oh, it's thank you awesome. guys. Love and to see you. Thanks for flying down. We really appreciate your time. Let's go. Yeah. Hey, guys. Ah! Thank you for your service. Now we're talking. Oh, thank you guys. Yep. Oh, wait, one last oh, yes. takeaway. Sure. People are saying thank you for your service now. When I first came in the military, that was not the case. Right. When I first came in the military, it was 1985, and there were signs in Norfolk, Virginia that said dogs and sailors keep off the lawn. That would not happen today. That is a change in the United States of America. I am here to humbly thank you. As a servant to this great country, thank you for thanking us. That is just, it's wonderful, and we really appreciate you. So God bless you, and God bless the USA. Awesome. Well deserved. Thank yeah. you. Great awesome. way to close it. Thank you, everybody. See you on the next one.